Compression. It's probably one word that strikes fear into the heart of nearly every single producer that I know. And there's a very good reason from that. It takes an awful lot of time to fully understand this subject. I've been asked so many times to start to explain this and talk about the different devices that are available to us now. And this is what I want to do, but I'm going to take a slightly different approach because looking around, nearly every video seems to be talking about how you compress something. This is the technique you should use. These are the settings. This is it. Absolutely brilliant. This is what you should do. Where actually the question we should all be asking is why do we compress something? Why should we be compressing a drum? an individual sound, a bass, a drum bus, or a mix bus. Why do we do it? And for me, the best way to understand absolutely anything is to go back and look at the history of these incredible devices. And that's what I want to do with this video. This is the first of a multi-part video series about compression from F9. After the Second World War, two new transmission technologies were really taking off, radio and TV. Now, initially, most of the broadcasts, the audio parts of the broadcast, were just people talking. And that's quite easy to control from an engineering point of view. Should things start to get a little bit heated, the engineers could just dial down the actual controls at their end. However, the moment TV really exploded and started to get into entertainment, things changed because music was being transmitted as well as the addition of a live studio audience. If any of you have been in an auditorium where a whole bunch of people clap, you'll know the noise is quite loud. Compared to people talking on a stage, the difference is astronomical. So I'm pretty sure in the early days, this is where when we see those um, applaud lights come on from those early TV uh, shows, I'm pretty sure this was done deliberately and the audience was primed so that the engineers could quietly hit that light and then turn things down a little bit. But obviously they were going to overshoot. And also when you start to get into the more dynamic forms of music that were coming, like big band music and all of that kind of stuff, should a brass section and a drummer kick off at once in one of those bands, you're going to, everyone was probably scrambling to keep things under control. So there needed to be an automated system. And this is where the story of the compressor really started. Now, do remember that both of these broadcast industries had a ton of money sloshing about in nearly every single country because they were completely mass market. Everybody wanted a bit of this. So this was, to my knowledge, the very first compressor that was commercially available for the broadcast industry. It's the Western Electric Program Amplifier 1110A. And let me just read you a little bit from the blurb. It provides continuous visual indication of the correctness of operating levels. In other words, the meter. And this is the first time I've seen this term used. Automatic graduated compression of excessive program peaks. So basically what this massive device that was about the size of a bathroom cabinet would do is that every time the audio got to a certain level, like for example, the crowd started applauding, it would pull the volume down. And of course, this was an absolute revelation. By today's standards, even though this thing is pretty big, it's a very simple circuit because they only had basic components available. These were all vacuum tubes or valves as they are sometimes known. And if you want to know why they're called valves, well, think of a pipe and think of a tap. This is the control signal coming in. If you want to control that flow of going water traveling through the pipe, what you do is you have a tap there and you can turn it on or off. If you turn it up, the flow increases. If you turn it down, the flow decreases. And it does that by using a valve. And a vacuum tube is an electronic version of a valve. Now the next thing to do is let's work out the basic principles of this kind of circuit and this kind of device. And I'm going to use the analogy of a 1990s teenager's bedroom, a stereo, and a parent who's getting a bit hacked off with the music. So in this analogy, we're going to use this audio fader, and this is going to be the analogy of the volume level of your stereo in your bedroom as a teenager. This is going to be a threshold, this zero point up here. So when the volume level reaches up there, your parents are going to have enough and they're going to shout, Oi, turn that down at you. OK, so here we go. You're being a belligerent teenager. The volume level's going up and up and up. Nothing's happening yet until you hit that threshold 
the threshold where your parents have had enough and they say, oi, turn that down. Now, what you are going to do is bring it down, but you're not going to turn it down all of the way. You're going to bring it down a little bit and that little bit is going to be determined by the ratio. So we're going to bring it down. But one other thing, you have control over the speed of how fast you're bringing the music down. And that is equivalent to the attack of the compressor. So if you bring it down really fast, you can see that it's going to be quite different from bringing it down slowly like that. There may even be a little delay before you start bringing it down. And that is the power of a compressor. And particularly the attack portion can be very, very important because a little bit of loud audio can sneak through. So in other words, you're going up, 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 turn that down. Oh, and there you go, you've turned it down. But there's that little delay. And that means you can catch the front of things like drums or bass sounds, and that gives a nice bit of punch. Now, also, being a belligerent teenager, oh God, it's so unfair, you guys just don't understand me, I hate you. You're gonna bring the volume level back up again once you think it's safe. And that is the equivalent to the release control. And depending on how particularly belligerent you're feeling that day, you might do it really quick. Yeah, whatever, what are you gonna do? And then you have to go, bonk, bring it down again as they go, all right, turn it down, etc., etc. Do that over something like a drum loop. And you can see there's constantly these little bits of gain reduction coming in when it hits that threshold. So to achieve that in a basic circuit, we're gonna need two things. We're gonna need an amplifier. Now we always think of amplifiers as turning things up, but they don't, they turn things down as well. And always pretty much in compression, particularly with hardware units, we are generally turning things down. And they do that by being controlled by uh, an electrical input that's created by another circuit that is detecting the level of the audio going in. So basically we create two signals. One is the actual path of the audio that's gonna be affected and the other one is for a control circuit going, oh, you've reached that level, time to actually do something. Now, in these early devices, all of that was done within valve circuitry and it's one of the reasons why these things are so big because given the heat that comes off these and the voltages used, everything needed to be quite spaced out. Um, the valves used in audio processes are nearly always what are known as thermionic devices and this uses a principle called thermionic emission. It's a technical term but all it basically means is heat something up and electrons will flow. Now this is why valves were used as amplifiers because it was one of the only devices available, in fact I think it was the only device available that was capable of doing this. But the problem is when you heat something up, obviously the whole thing is going to be giving off uh, an awful lot of energy and this is why valve equipment does tend to be bigger. Now another thing that I really need you to understand is if you're relying on something heating up within a physical device, that heat is gonna take a small amount of time to actually build up. And you're probably not gonna be able to have much control over how long that actually takes to rise in heat and reach the correct operating level. That gives valve-based amplifiers a particular characteristic, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Now also, because money was no object in these circumstances, and because of the voltages involved with these devices, they had to electrically isolate all of this stuff. So great big transformers were used on the input and output of these devices. Valves are quite interesting in the fact that they are what's known as non-linear devices. What I mean by that is they will inherently create distortions as they pass audio through them. Now this is a transfer graph. You don't have to worry about the maths for the minute. It's got a straight line on it. This is a linear transfer graph. So in other words, what comes in may be amplified or turned down, but it's going to be an exact representation. This is the kind of transfer graph that you're going to see with a valve. You see it's like an S curve. Now also, as you can see here, there are two parts to this curve. There are two little S's there, and that is because the rise up to one state may have a different response to the fall back down. And that's inherent within um, valves. And all of this kind of stuff creates distortion. But here's the key thing. It is a very pleasurable distortion. It kind of works with our human condition. We actually like the sound of these things. You add that to the non-linearities of the transformers on the output, and it's easy to see why all of these additional harmonics that build up can help thicken a sound and actually give a pleasing tone to the devices.
Now, obviously, lots of other companies realized there was a market here and started to get in in the action. And there was, because the recording industry was also brand new, you had this interesting mixture of electronic engineers and musicians coming together. And one of them licensed their design of a compressor circuit that was actually used on Les Paul's recording setup. Yes, that Les Paul from the guitar fame. Um, and he created a broadcast and recording device and his company was called Fairchild. And obviously the Fairchild 660 and 670 series are some of the most infamous compressors. Now what's interesting on these early valve devices is that there is a time constant control. Now this is actually generally the release control of the compressor. It's difficult to get have an attack control on a, on a valve compressor circuit because you're physically waiting for things to heat up, as we mentioned earlier. Valves have a couple of really serious issues. One, they're just totally unreliable, particularly in the early designs, because manufacturing was nowhere near the level that it is now. And these things were encased in glass with uh, really detailed components inside, and there were manufacturing defects all over the place. You add that to heat and high voltage. I mean, the, the voltages used to drive amps is quite extraordinary compared to modern technology. These things would fail left, right, and center. They would also be noisy, they could be unreliable, and this kind of thing is not the kind of technology that you're gonna want long-term in any kind of critical audio device that's connected to things like live TV shows and all the rest of it. But luckily, there was a savior coming over the hills, and that was the transistor. These relatively tiny devices were an absolute godsend to anyone building these kind of circuits that relied on amplifiers. They used far less power, they generated far less heat, which means you could put them closer together. They were just way, way more efficient and they would last infinitely longer compared to a valve. Now there was a chap called Bill Putman uh, who had a company called Universal Audio. Yes, it is that Universal Audio that we now know as UAD. And he used one of the very first types of transistor called a field effect transistor or FET. Now you've probably seen the term FET in lots of uh, recent plugins to describe a, a compressor type. And he designed what would turn out to be one of the most important compressor designs of all time, the 1176. And it must have just been a revolution because he was able with transistors not only to build a better amplifier circuit, but a better detection circuit too. Now, he found out very quickly that field effect or FET transistors worked much quicker than valves. You could actually start to bring the volume down incredibly quickly. However, I think he pretty soon discovered that sometimes you might not want it to come down that quickly. So for one of the first major compressor designs, he was able to put an attack control on. And this would actually slow down the fast acting FET compressor by a controllable amount. So in other words, you got to decide how quickly it would grab that fader down or that volume level down. Now, thanks to the flexibility that was offered by these new transistors, Bill Putman came up with a little bit of a trick in compressor design that is still very much loved to this day. Now we've talked about how a compressor works. So the signal comes in, hits the amplifier, the amplifier is controlled by the detection circuit. But let's just, just, let's just actually think about how this works in terms of routing. Here's the audio coming in, hits the amplifier and goes out that way. You have to create the detection circuit, which means you have to tap off and create a copy effectively the audio coming in. Now this is the main chain of the audio. This is known as the side chain, a term that I'm sure we're all familiar with now. Now in most compressor designs, I believe up until this point, it was actually pulled, the, the side chain was pulled from the input. So in other words, it was split off down here, detection happened and then that told the compressor what to do. That is known as a forward feed compressor. What Bill discovered is that you could actually tap the output of the compressor and run the detection circuit from that. And that is called a feedback compressor circuit. Now this terminology is still used to this day, even on things like the Ableton Live built-in compressor. Here are the three circuits, forward feed one, forward feed two, and feedback. Why this was important is that the feedback compressor sounded nicer. Now, no one's quite sure why, but it's just down to the way our ears work. And sometimes you have these happy accidents. 
But it's something to bear in mind because this terminology does leak through to all sorts of compressor circuits that you're going to be exposed to now. Now, another little leap here was the ability within transistor circuits to really be able to dial in the amount of compression that you wanted by changing the compression ratio. So you remember when we looked at the fader, that is how much that fader was actually moving up and down. Now, he put a series of buttons on the front of the 1176 um, and they increased actually in ratio as you push them up. Now, of course, they were designed to just be one, but later, naughty engineers discovered that if you shoved all three on, the compression was absolutely mammoth. And that's sometimes why in documentation connected to 1176 flavored plugins, you'll see this stuff about the all button mode. That's what it means. Someone discovered that if you shoved all of those ratio buttons in, the thing just went into overdrive, distorted heavily, mental compression ratios, but amazing on things like drums. Now, what's interesting is up until this point, nearly all of the valve-based compressors used a, a system called variable mu. Now, we won't go into the reason why a Greek letter was used and all the rest of it, because it's all down to electronics, but effectively, the ratio of the compressor was actually dependent on the audio going into it. So that's why when you see variable mu compressors on plugins or on hardware now, they're using that kind of circuit design. So in other words, the, the, the louder the information goes in, the harder the ratio is going to be. One thing to really understand is that FET was decidedly uncolored as a technology as compared to valves. But there is still a sound to these devices. And I've always found with 1176s, there's a lovely brightness, which is why they're so pleasant on vocals. But please also bear in mind, these were being designed at the, what I would call almost like a golden age of discovery and, and technology. And it was almost as if money was no object. And also because the components would be noisy or not work very well if they were cheap. Only the highest level of components were ever used in these early devices. So the 1176, like many of its contemporaries, used the best components that were possibly available and transformers to electrically isolate it. Now, transformers are non-linear too, so they'll add a bit of color to the sound. So you can see why these early components and these early devices have this aura of mojo about them. It's because it's just these distortions that are being created inside of these devices. A few other devices popped up around the same time. And the photoresistor is a resistor whose kind of resistance to current would change depending on light that was actually falling on it. So someone had the bright idea of using a lamp as a detection circuit. So in other words, you feed the incoming audio that's basically a side chain into a lamp. The lamp glows on and off with the actual music. And then you seal it up in a tube, put a photoresistor at the bottom and use that to power a transistor to turn the music up and down. Now, one of the beauties of this, as we discussed with the valves, like all anything that involves heat, it takes time for the lamp to actually reach full brightness and to dim down again. It's not instantaneous, not like a modern LED light. And because of that, this would smooth the audio signal out a little bit and give a really nice slow attack to the compression circuit. Now, the most famous example of this is the LA-2A. And in the 90s, um, someone re sort of retook a whole series of circuits created for the legendary producer Joe Meek and repackaged them. So you'll often see these green hardware Joe Meek branded devices that are all opto compressors. Now, I've actually got one in the rack behind me. It's made by a brilliant company called Handcrafted Labs. And at one point when it went wrong, uh, I actually took it apart and it was just a little bit of shrink sleeving between the lamp and the photoresistor. It was so simple to kind of put it all back together. These simplistic designs still have their own merit. So every time you see the term opto on a modern compressor plug-in, that's the kind of circuit that it's emulating and it's slow effect of heating this lamp on and off. Now, obviously technology was not gonna stand still. And what came next changed absolutely everything in terms of compression and the way that we use it. So join us for part two next time.